In, in spite of long and generous introductions, I think most of you are guessing that there's something else going on in my being invited here. And if you know the trustees of the Banner of Truth, you'll know that there's a strong voting block of Scottish representation on the, the board. And uh, my chief benefit today is that I'm local uh, and thus save on travel expenses to the trust. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful to be with you today. Uh, it's often been said that timeless truths are the most timely truths, and certainly that's the case as we consider uh, communion with God. Well, an organizer's worst fear in asking a church historian to come to a minister's conference is that he might just end up telling stories. Uh, today, your worst nightmares are, will be realized. Uh, I plan on uh, telling three stories about the lives, the books, and the burials of William Strong. But uh, so that there'll be truth in advertising, we will indeed consider the astonishing reality of our communion with God. Well, I've tried to get an outline distributed. Don't worry if you didn't receive it. Uh, it's designed not so much uh, to add clarity to the lecture as to give you some hope that it will end. Uh, and, uh, uh, the clock will perform pretty much the same purpose, uh, so, so don't, don't be too eager to get it. Well, William Strong passed away suddenly, probably in his mid-40s. He was a well-connected minister, favored by Oliver Cromwell in his later years. And Strong, after he died, was given his first burial in Westminster Abbey, within sight of royal tombs. Two decades previously, nothing could have seemed less likely than such a dignified end. Uh, for soon after he earned his degrees from the University of Cambridge and received his first job, Strong had them taken away again. Strong had been overheard predicting that there might soon be no bishops in England, a beautiful thing. Uh, and uh, he was also overheard wondering if someone had sinned against the Holy Spirit. That someone was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and he made sure that Strong quickly lost his fellowship, had his uh, degrees revoked from the university, and was banished from Cambridge. Strong disappears from history for a little while, only to reemerge as a rector in the lovely county of Dorset, which, by the way, is not quite as lovely as the neighboring county of Devon, a point that my wife gently made when she asked to go to Devon for a holiday, and I accidentally took the family to Dorset instead. Well, first banished to his birthplace, Strong was some years later exiled again uh, to, this time, to England's greatest city. Uh, when civil war came to the Atlantic Isles in the 1640s, royalists came to Dorset, and they forced Strong, who was a known Puritan, to flee. And this time he reappeared in his church, in a church in Fleet Street in the heart of London. And there he first served as a lecturer, which meant that he was responsible for preaching. And later he served as a minister, which, as you know, meant that he was responsible for everything. Sadly, his hard times were not quite over. Even as his reputation as a preacher gradually grew, his financial situation remained difficult. In fact, it came to the point that, where he was forced to borrow money from his own congregation uh, because they had not been paying him very well, uh, simply to make ends meet. Well, finally, just as the Fleet Street Church began to realize that they might lose their minister due to their own poor care, Strong found himself wanted on every side. He was appointed to the Westminster Assembly. A famous new lecture series at Westminster Abbey featured Strong as the weekly preacher, as one of the weekly preachers. And both houses of parliament and the city of London began asking him to preach on key public occasions. St. Margaret's Church, next door to the Abbey, appointed Strong to serve as a lecturer. And all the while, he served as the pastor of the Fleet Street Church until suddenly, in 1650, 
with England firmly in the grip of Congregationalist civil magistrates, Strong discovered that he had become a Congregationalist too, and he left his Presbyterian congregation behind, uh, moving instead to a Congregational congregation. Well, it might have been during his Presbyterian pastorate at Fleet Street that Strong first began to consider in depth the subject of communion with God. At some point, he preached a series of sermons on Exodus 20, verse 24. I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. He might have been a Presbyterian when he preached those sermons because after he died, the manuscripts from those sermons were in Presbyterian hands. But what complicates our story is that William Strong was living a double life of sorts. For near the time of his death, the public preacher was quietly trying to become an author. Strong had published a handful of sermons in the 1640s and another sermon uh, in the year of his death, 1654. But in the year before he died, he tried his hand at a short Latin treatise, which was printed without his name on the title page. And more significantly, he was busy preparing manuscripts, large manuscripts, on important theological topics, each intended for the press. These were actual books and not simply sermon series recast as books. These new works included a book on the human will, and they also included an entirely new work on communion with God, a study now centered not on Exodus 20, but on Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Most people didn't know that Strong was writing. And so when, by providence, as he explains it, one of his old Presbyterian friends, John Herring, found Strong's entire Exodus series on communion with God put into his hands, he thought it was something pretty special. And he surprised Strong's family and closest friends by uh, promptly printing the work naming Strong, of course, as the author. It hit the book sales in late, in late uh, 1655, and it was toted as something remarkable because someone had produced such a clear text from shorthand. Well, the work was entitled The Saint's Communion with God, and everything seemed well until in early 1656, another book came out on the same subject. The second book, entitled Communion with God in Ordinances, was more than twice as long as the first. And surprisingly, it condemned the printing of the first book in no uncertain terms. No less than the Congregationalist John Rao, the Congregationalist Ralph Venning, and the Presbyterian Thomas Manton argue that the longer book was the better one, the more authentic one, not the one to, that, that needed to replace uh, the one edited by John Herring. Rao, Venning, and Manton revealed that Strong had been writing books, and he did not want his sermons printed as books. So now there were two books on communion with God, and some of Strong's friends only wanted people to read one of them. Well, what happens when we're told not to do something? I, for one, picked up the condemned work first and read the authorized book second. And having read both, I regret to inform you that I have a slight preference for the wrong one. Well, what I need to say about these two editions can be said in about four minutes. It turns out that even if Reverend Herring's intentions were good, the printer was not a discerning publisher like the Banner of Truth Trust. Printer George Strawbridge put out anything from carefully edited Episcopal prayer books to crudely assembled Puritan pamphlets, whatever he could get his hands on that might make a little money. When the Herring Strawbridge edition was questioned, Strawbridge responded by printing an unfortunate notice that insisted no one could trust a text supposedly written by Strong himself, since Strong had a private system of shorthand that no one else knew. Well, that was too much. William Strong's widow, Damaris, 
promptly wade into the dispute, correcting facts and begging readers to favor the official saint's communion instead of the unofficial communion with God. Oh, excuse me, I got that wrong. To favor the official communion with God instead of the unofficial saint's communion. Damaris claimed that her husband did not want his sermons printed as they had been spoken. He wanted his works printed as they had been written or at least edited by him for publication. What's more, the shorthand system that Strong used was a well-known system and any symbols unique to him had been taught to a friend of the family who was put in charge of transcribing all authorized texts for publication. So what's at stake in the argument? Well, first, there was a conviction that only works approved by Strong or the Strong family were really ready for the press. Second, there was a worry about money. The Herring Strawbridge edition undercut sales of what Damaris thought was the better book. What's worse, the Strawbridge criticism of official versions of Strong's work, the doubt that he threw on those editions could threaten the sale of all her husband's books. And given that she had no income, she worried that this would spoil mine and my children's benefits that we might otherwise receive by those my husband's labors. It was a pretty sensible concern. And third and finally, Damaris may also have been concerned that the lady Elizabeth Carr, a talented Scotswoman who was in declining financial circumstances, would find her own work of transcribing the shorthand to be a waste of time if people were reading pirated works. That could turn Lady Carr off the important task of transcribing these works and getting them out to the press. Well, it seems that the solution to unauthorized, unauthorized printing was hurried printing. And uh, the Strong family uh, they quickly edited as many works as they could and announced a series of forthcoming publications. But speed came at a cost. Communion with God came out within three months, and it looks like a rushed job. Damaris had criticized the printing of the saints' communion uh, for, for looking too scholarly. It's unlikely that communion with God will ever receive that same criticism. Now, I'm sharing this story with you because in spite of these details, I've decided to use both books this morning to help you and to help me understand Strong's doctrine, Strong's uh, convictions about communion with God. I'm also sharing this with you because I'm in some serious need of group therapy. Uh, what you're looking at this morning is the haggard face of a man who's lived many days in tension with Thomas Manton. Manton was a giant of a theologian, a friend of the Strong family, and above all, the friendliest looking minister in the long and grim history of Puritan portraiture. Who doesn't want to be on the same side of the story as Thomas Manton? But the main reason for treating these two books together is that these rival editions are mutually informing. They come at the subject from different angles. Contrary to the assertions of friends and family, Strong's voice seems to emerge clearly in Saints' Communion. It's not a voice that's radically different than we find in other strong publications. It's the voice of a loving, earnest, vivid, practical preacher. And in fact, it makes me wonder sometimes if the voice that's muffled is the professional voice and not the preaching voice. Indeed, I find it telling that when Ralph Venning tried to summarize a main point of the official publication, he ended up using a phrase that's only found in the unofficial one. The phrase that he found helpful was Strong's concept of immediate communion. It turns out there's many reasons why Strong wanted to write about immediate communion or communion with God in ordinances. According to one friend, Strong's heart was much set on this subject of communion. Manton encouraged readers to hear Strong on the subject because none are so fit to speak of communion with God as those that have experimented in it in their own souls. And having dwelt on the subject here, Manton explained, that Strong had now gone to heaven to experiment 
what it is to have communion with God in the world to come. But Strong not only wanted to write about communion, he wanted to write about communion with God in ordinances. Strong wanted to address the subject of ordinances in part because he saw three problems, all of them, I might add, still visible in the church today. First, there were those who did not think they were worthy of ordinances, by which he means prayer, and preaching, reading of the word of God, and the administration of the sacraments. Second, there are those who think that ordinances are below them. Strong was writing in the 1640s, a time when the church culture was chaotic, and in which Christians, some Christians at least, thought that ordinances were milk fit for babes, but not meat fit for strong men, as Strong explains. Quakers and other sects were on the rise, all kinds of weirdness, and many of this underemphasized the ordinary means of grace. My term, not Strong's. Third, there were those who acted as though the ordinances were an end in themselves. Their focus was on their prayers, on their sermons, on the elements of the sacraments themselves. Sacraments, again, my term, not Strong's. But of greater interest than his own experience and contemporary problems was his conviction that the sweep of the scriptures, the center of the gospel, indeed the whole experience of the Christian life, is really about communion with God. As Strong understood, in the state of innocence, Adam's life was a life of communion. In fact, in his creation, he had a double excellency in respect of his image and in respect of his communion. And from both of these, Strong says, he fell. Since that time, every man is at a distance from God. There's a twofold distance that's between God and the creatures. First, a distance in point of reconciliation. Secondly, a distance in point of communion. As Strong puts it, there's a natural distance as we are creatures and a moral distance as we are sinners. For Strong, the twofold distance included on the one hand what we might call the creature-creator distinction which Red has so helpfully described already, a created or natural distance that inhibits communion. He rarely mentions this created distance in point of creation and does not elaborate on it, but I will return to it. On the other hand, there's also a moral distance. Strong argues that our holy image became vile and that Adam fell from his image. By sin, he explains, we lost both our image and our fellowship. Thus, blessedness is now out of reach of the whole creation. For one creature cannot make another blessed. Nay, all the creatures cannot make one creature blessed. Man has fallen too low for his fellow creature to advance him. He's too sore for the whole creation to make him a plaster or a band-aid. This is our situation. And Strong says, we cannot fix it ourselves. But praise be to God, he has a remedy. And Strong describes that remedy in two different ways in his two different books. In the 1656 Communion with God, Strong's later authorized written piece based on Hebrews 10 verse 22, he begins with the priesthood of Christ and the accomplishment of redemption. Christ's priesthood is for Strong the main thing that which God doth chiefly look at and would have us chiefly instructed in as being the foundation of all the rest of his offices and of the benefits that we have by them all. Studying Hebrews, Strong concludes that Christ's priesthood is the sum of both testaments and the way to give us communion once more. The Lord hath graciously provided for us such a priest to bring us to God again. Wonderfully, God's throne of glory is by Christ's priesthood made a throne of grace. In this second work, Strong concludes that man hath a double business by Christ to recover his former image and his former communion. The business of Christ, he says, is to repair the one and restore the other. 
We are to have a desire to have that restored, which was then, that is at the fall, lost. Strong's 1655, Saints' Communion, Strong's earlier preached unauthorized peace based on Exodus 20, verse 24, begins with the way in which God comes to us by revealing himself. This book already assumes the accomplishment of, 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 of redemption and the history of redemption. Here he considers the church as redeemed. And he concludes that one of the principal ends which God aims at in the setting up of his public ordinances is that he may have communion with the saints and that his saints might have communion with him. Strong unfolds that doctrine in three distinct points. First, and wonderfully, the scriptures hold forth such a state. That is a state of communion with God. We see the fact of communion between God and his people in that the saints are called God's friends, which speaks of high familiarity. The saints are called his bride as, as one that's acquainted with all his secrets. The saints are described as having one spirit with God, as if there were a union of two souls, or as he quotes Cyprian, a confederacy of affections. Through Christ, God walks with us, eats and drinks with us, dwells with us, even, as Strong reads the Song of Solomon, lies together with us in the bed of ordinances. Do you understand this point? This conference is not about how we come into union, how we come into communion with God. This conference is not helping us get into communion. We are already in communion with God. Every saint is. Because every saint speaks to God and listens to God. Second and foundationally, the communion that the saints have with God is with all the persons in the Trinity. Strong argues that we have not only communion with the Father, but communion with the Son. And not only communion with the Son, but with the Spirit also. With all persons in the Trinity the people of God have community. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the leading truth in saints' communion. And it's repeated even more fully in that book. Communion with the triune God deserves its own lecture. As Strong sees it, in this communion there are these two things. First, the persons dignify the communion. Second, the communion dignifies the persons that enjoy it. For a beggar to have communion with a king, it is a very high privilege. But nothing compared with the saints enjoying communion with God, he says. Ordinary communion with extraordinary persons raises it to a great height. This is a glorious foundation a foundational point to consider when, when thinking about the blessing of our communion with God. And Strong puts it clearly, even if he puts it briefly. Third, and practically, this communion in this life is chiefly in ordinances. Here Strong at last gets to the point of his book, or rather the point of both books, as we can see in their fuller titles. The 1655 book is entitled, the saints' communion with God, and God's communion with them in ordinances. The 1656 book is entitled, Communion with God in Ordinances, the Saints' Privilege and Duty. But before we discuss ordinances, what are the grounds for our communion? In communion with God, the principal ground is the priesthood of Christ. In the saints' communion, Strong mentions five main grounds. First, the electing love of God. Second, the covenant state where in believers stand. Third, and as we heard last night from Conrad, union with Jesus Christ is the ground for our communion. Indeed, Strong insists that there can be no communion where there is no union. But at the same time, there is always communion where there is union. 
Our interest in the spirit is the fourth ground, for the spirit of Christ is not only received as a bond of union, but as a means of communion. The spirit is the special author and worker of this fellowship. And finally, our conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ. This last point receives sustained practical focus and treatment by Strong. He argues that conformity is the ground of communion. The more likeness there is in any creature, one to another, the more love. And the more love, the more desire of communion. Birds of a feather will flock together. Do you see his point? We are all in communion with God. But who is it that's in sweet communion with God? Stated bluntly, as men grow up in conformity to God, so they will grow up in communion with God. For, as Strong says, conformity is the ground of communion. So the more conformity, the greater the communion still. As the life of holiness grows up within us, so communion with God flows in upon us. Men don't have the same degree of communion with God, he concludes. Conformity is a necessary concomitant to communion with God. But how do we commune with God after all? Communion's now not possible in the way that it once was. In our state of innocence, our first parents enjoyed a life of constant communion, an immediate, a direct fellowship with God. But now, but now it's different. No ordinances were needed for our first parents to have communion with God when they were created. But Strong explains that after the fall, all of that changes. If we are to have sweet fellowship with God on this side of heaven, it must be immediate communion. Our communion is chiefly in ordinances, he explains. For the immediate communion is reserved for another world. All the communion we have in this world, it's immediate communion through which God conveys grace unto us and draws us unto him. <clears throat> there's the wall of sin and there's the windows of ordinances. He stands behind our wall of sin, but he looks through the windows. Of course, ordinances do not do this in and of themselves. He explains that Christ is the ladder that takes us near to God and brings us near and brings him near to us. Ordinances are merely set up to be a means of fellowship and communion with him and his people. For our happiness consists in our communion with God. The whole point of our prayers, brothers, of our preaching, of our listening, of the Lord's Supper, is to help us have happy communion with God through Christ. Ordinances used without that purpose, Strong explains, are idols, and the practice is idolatry. Strong, whose mother no doubt told him it was impolite to speak without a mouthful of metaphors, puts it like this. The glass is gospel ordinances. They're the windows by which we look into the glory of God. Alas, without this, preaching is but babbling. Praying is but howling. It's not the ordinances that put a glory upon God. It's God who puts a glory on the ordinances. To partake of an ordinance without an intention to commune with God, he says, is like taking medicine without any intention uh, to improve your health or plowing a field with no interest in a harvest. Strong insists that in our use of ordinances, we must always be seeking after communion, after fellowship with our God. Strong thus focuses on ordinances as a means to an end, as a means to communion with God. Of course, ordinances allow us to show and grow in our friendship with God. Ordinances bring us joy by reminding us of our privileges. But most of all, ordinances allow us to experience closeness with our God. Near the end of Saints' Communion, a distinction is introduced 
between ra- sanctifying communion and what he calls ravishing communion. In communion with God, he urges that the business of communion is to be increased in degrees till he bring a soul to a perfect communion of the vision and fruition of God forever. Brothers, we're, we're to ever be seeking to be in closer communion with our God. And what will it be that draws us to our God, that, that, that helps us to ascend into that communion? Well, in part, a sense of our own emptiness, he explains. We loathe even the sweetest honeycomb when our bellies are full. There must also be a sense of our own inability and our own unworthiness. But even more, we need a clear grasp of his power, a knowledge of his wisdom, a sense of his open heart towards his people. Ultimately, the only way to raise up our communion with God is to raise up our apprehension of him. If we know him but a little, we can never enjoy much society and communion with him. Using a favorite illustration and not showing the reticence that Conrad had about using examples that involve royalty, uh, Strong suggests that it's something like, like the situation of a favorite of a prince or a king. Someone who does not know the king's company will will be fine uh, when he doesn't have it. But if this fellowship was taken away from a favorite, it breaks his heart. The Christian experiences communion. But to what end does communion tend? I think each of us by now has clearly grasped at least one part of that answer. One of the great ends, not simply means, but one of the great ends that God aims at in communion is the exercise of our graces. For Strong explains, he would not have the graces of his people to lie still, to be like swords rusting in their scabbards. But most of all, through this communion, God shows that he's able to give you and me a more perfect communion than Adam had as he also gives you a more perfect righteousness. As we have not a distinct righteousness from Christ's righteousness, so we have not a distinct fellowship from or apart from Christ's fellowship. And strikingly strong adds all the communion that Christ had in the human nature with the Father. It is for us and in our behalf, in our place, for our sakes. Just think of that. Christ fulfilled the law perfectly, and in union with him, we find a righteousness reserved for ourselves that is far better than anything we could have ever hoped to earn for ourselves. But it's not just that strong as saying. So too, as Christ's fellowship with the Father so perfectly, we in union with Christ have that communion for ourselves. That means that any deficiencies in our communion with the Father are covered over by the fact that the Father sees us communing in with him in his Son. And again, because this communion privilege is won for us by the second Adam, it will be much sweeter, more permanent, richer in every way, than the communion enjoyed by the first Adam. Strong's conversion to congregationalism did not keep him from good fellowship with other godly pastors. And four years later, four years after he uh, left his Presbyterian church, it was a Presbyterian pastor named Obadiah Sedgwick who preached his friend's funeral sermon with more grief of heart than he had ever felt, and to a congregation of men and women with more weeping eyes than he had ever seen. But unfortunately, after Strong's death, there was not only controversy about his books, but soon there was controversy about his body. If his first book lacked the dignity that his family wanted, his first burial more than compensated. Uh, The bodies of people who enjoy status were buried inside churches. And only the greatest of people were laid to rest in Westminster Abbey. 
But while his family could improve the literary remains of their Presbyterian-turned-Congregationalist, they could do nothing to stop, to stop Episcopalians from digging up Strong's physical remains at the restoration of King Charles II and throwing the corpse into a purpose-built pit in St. Margaret's Church graveyard near where he used to preach. There he lay beside other Puritan worthies exhumed from Westminster Abbey. And without a proper burial place, his enemies hoped that Strong would be forever forgotten. And he pretty much has been. Apart from a, uh, a, an academic thesis and a couple articles, uh, there have been no scholarly treatments or even popular treatments of Strong. You, you're not going to find Strong's works on the bookshelves, not yet at least. Uh, maybe this will be the year when someone gives a donation uh, to allow the banner to print his collected works. Uh, but you're not going to find his works uh, in, in, in the book room uh, after this talk. I suppose there were, there were some discussions of his theology. We mostly find them in long forwards, which on occasion make points even better than Strong does himself. Forwards do that sometimes. I, I think it's always been the case in forwards to my own books. But I think our task this morning is to consider Strong's two books on communion with God. And, 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 and first identify their strengths and then ask if there are ways in which his work can, commune, can strengthen our own a communion with God. My first point of appreciation for Strong is found in his emphasis on Trinitarian communion. Strong actually makes this point a couple years before John Owen does. Uh, unfortunately, Owen gets to be on the brochure of our conference, in spite of the fact that Strong was first. It's a fair decision, however. I, I don't think there's any surviving portrait of Strong. Uh, but what Strong says about our Trinitarian communion with God, it's clear, it's strong, and it's to the point. Second, the, the Westminster like the Westminster Standards that he helped to write, our author is helpfully clear in grounding union or grounding a communion on our union with Christ. It's essential for us to see that our spirit wrought union with Christ must come before any acts or hope of communion. As he puts it, there must be a state of marriage before ever there be a performance of the acts of the married. This, too, is a point made very clearly and helpfully in both works. Third, it's, it's, it's helpful to hear that communion with God requires conformity to God. It's one of the most, in one of the most stimulating sections in either book, Strong elaborates on, what it's, on what's entailed by this conformity, uh, suggesting that there's a, there's a kind of impression of the glorious attributes of God in stamped upon every Christian. Strong offers six examples, which you can see on your outline, and, which I, I, and you can read at your ledger. Uh, but this just scratches the surface. He has pages of reflection on this important subject. Fourth, I appreciate how careful Strong is in describing a kind of higher communion that can be increased in degrees. Earlier writers, perhaps trying to get at the same point, most notably a late medieval German writers and even early Martin Luther himself, sometimes spoke about kinds or degrees of union with God. How much better it is to speak about kinds or even better degrees of communion with God. For there is only one union with God. It is through Christ, and it is a saving union. Fifth, since the church so often underestimates the means of grace, for various reasons, I think a better term than ordinances, how helpful it is for Strong to remind us that in this age, our communion is a immediate communion. We must never expect to become close to God without much prayer, preaching, reading, listening, praising, 
and partaking of the sacraments. We long for a communion that is not mediated. And it was fitting for John Herring to rejoice that Strong is now enjoying an eternal communion with God above, with etern an eternal communion with God above ordinances. This is what awaits every child of God. Not mediate communion, but immediate with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. An Adam-like walking with God. A Moses-like friendship with God. In fact, something better than either is reserved for even the weakest of saints. But here, our communion is mediate. Of course, whether mediate or immediate, we always commune with the same God. The God does not get better. The fellowship with him does grow sweeter. With this fistful of praises, perhaps you'll pardon one suggestion for improvement. I said I'd come back to this because in asserting that there's no communion because of the vileness of our nature, Strong is not consistently clear. Context suggests that the vileness he rightly has in mind is our created inferiority compared to God. But by no communion, he seems to be asserting that there's no communication between God and man as we are created. And that cannot be. And it underestimates better and clearer comments that we find elsewhere about Adam's communion in his created state. Yes, we need to affirm an infinite gap between those created lower than the angels and the dignity, the, the majesty, the very being of God. There is a creator-creature distinction. But we must also remember and emphasize the creator-creature relation founded upon the fact that we are made in the image of God. Strong will say on occasion, not only that our holy image became vile and man fell from God's image, but also, imprecisely, that by sin we lost both our image and our fellowship. Now, that's an unhappy phrase, even if it's not entirely uncommon among theologians. On this point, I prefer the clarity of Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7, paragraph 1, which states that the distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part. It's, it's this understanding, the voluntary condescension discussed in the confession. It, it went, it, let me retry that sentence. It, as, as I understand it, the voluntary condescension discussed in the confession doesn't fix a problem. It offers a benefit. The creator's condescension is not designed to address a created problem such as a lack of communion or communication between God and man. Rather, it offers the benefit of eschatological communion, a promise of God dwelling with us forever, rather than God walking with us in the garden. If I have one point of critique, so much remains for us to reflect on this morning, and indeed for a long time hereafter. In these books, we encounter a strong man, who allows us to enter his house and plunder away, uh, taking much with us. I want to note, for example, how Strong argues that our communion with God is the foundation on which all our fellowships are laid. When man fell into sin, we turned against God and against one another. But now we live as those whose communion with God and with one another through Christ is being restored. Now, now, Strong acknowledges that people will speak poorly of Christians. He doesn't put us in heaven before our time. Nonetheless, Strong suggests that the more fellowship any man hath with God, 
the more friendship he shall have amongst men. Just look around you this morning. Aren't we seeing a taste of that truth? Is it not the case that those who have communion with God also discover a world of friends? Are we not experiencing this benefit at this very conference? So let us make the most of this communion with each other by encouraging each other in three particular ways. First, I urge you to pray for and encourage your fellow pastors in their communion with God. Because sometimes pastors discover that in their busyness, in the, that, that their business is with the ordinance alone, as Strong puts it, and not with Christ in the ordinance. Sometimes a minister goes away satisfied, Strong says, though he has no breathing from God therein, no tokens of God's presence. We're just thankful we pronounced that long name correctly in baptism. We're just glad we didn't drop the communion plate after that fumble. We're just thankful that we prayed to God in complete sentences. And we forget to commune with Christ. Can we pray for ourselves? Can we pray for others that we will commune with Christ in all his ordinances? Our prayers as we sing, our prayers as we speak to the Lord, the reading and, and the preaching of God, the administration of the sacraments. Can we pray that we will not lose sight of God and that, in fact, we will draw closer to God in the use of these ordinances? Second and closely related, strong warns us all against doing outward duties to satisfy our consciences. That's a temptation for all of us. Not least in those duties that no one else sees but God. But again, all communion with the duty is nothing to him if we do not have communion with God with it, Strong says. Can we pray that all of us will seek more than duty as we do our duty? Can we pray for communion with God for ourselves and for others as we pray to God tonight? as we pick up our Bibles tomorrow morning and, and, and not simply accomplish a successful routine. Finally, Strong writes that when a man has communion with God, it is the springtime of grace. But later he adds, if you lose thy communion, thy graces will not flourish. It will be all winter and a wilderness within thy soul. Am I right to wonder if some of us came to the conference in a wilderness? There's springtime without, but there's a lot of winter within. I have known this sometimes. So did the ministers who commended these different works by William Strong. There can be a mystery to this cold, this frost, because sometimes it appears out of season when we're expecting everything to be going well. But let me urge you, as William Strong urges his readers, that when you feel the frost descending on your soul, to still continue seeking communion with God, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through ordinances. For these are the golden pipes through which the Spirit conveys the oil of God's grace and of his presence. I can try and be practical as I as I think about these challenges, we can ask, are, are you reading the word of God and not communing with Christ? Well, consider reading or listening to a sermon to help you along. Are you drooping in solitary communion? Maybe a friend who is seeking that same communion with God through Christ can help you. Are you praying but not sensing God's presence? Well, maybe it's time to sing. Or are you seeking communion, but not really seeking conformity? That won't work. Let us pray for the Lord to sanctify us as ministers, students, elders, and deacons. But most of all, let us remember that in Christ, our communion with God is perfect. That, that the Father sees us as those whose communion is sweet rich and full. We don't live under his condemnation. 
We are not trying to get into communion with God. We are seeking to sweeten our communion with God. And let us remember that because of Christ, there will come a day, brothers, when our communion will be constant, will be steady, will be rich every morning. On that day, we will not merely walk with God as did Adam or limp with God as we do now, but we will live with him. For the dwelling place of God will be with man. He will dwell with us and we will be his people. And our communion will be with the Father and with the Son through the Spirit. And it will never be again a mediate communion. For God himself will be with us. He will be our God. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we ask that you would help us to better know you, Trinity and unity, and unity and Trinity. Give us the joy of soul communion with you by faith through gospel ordinances so that now no longer in the temple, but through every gospel gift of the Lord Jesus, we would see with clarity and say with affection and comfort, the Lord is my Lord. We ask that as with Jacob on his pilgrimage, then even when we limp along, would we, would, we would be able to confess, surely the Lord is in this place. Though sometimes I, I did not know it. Help us to rest in the reconciliation that we have through our Redeemer, our union with him, and our ever sweeter communion with you and all the saints. Do this by your holy and powerful spirit, because we ask this through the name of Christ our Savior, to whom we come in this ordinance of prayer. Amen.